So a very warm welcome um, to everybody. Uh, my name is Saskia Witterborn. I am head of the graduate division um, and associate professor here at the School of Journalism and Communication. Um, the talk is part of our talk series. Some of you might be familiar with it, uh, Conversation with Communicators, and we, which kicks off pretty much every academic year in sept early September. Um, and tonight's title is Maintaining Trust in a Hostile Context, and our esteemed speaker is Adrian War, uh, whom I'm going to introduce with these kind of, you know, selective and appreciative words. So according to the Cambridge Dictionary, trust means to believe that someone is good and honest and will not harm you, and that something is safe and reliable. Trust can be gained and destroyed, rebuilt and taught, and the human world trust is the glue of social relationships. And yet, when people trust, they put themselves at risk. Currently, one could say that we have a crisis of trust, where the old saying, trust your instinct, is more of a speech ritual that appeals to a mystic, symbolic universe that is supposed to give us guidance in face of political and economic uncertainties. Trust can make people vulnerable and does not only have the outcomes one would hope for, from feeling betrayed by friends and partners, misled by organization and governments, or trusting one's bodily immunity, not wearing a mask and getting sick. During the COVID-19 pandemic, mis- and disinformation have eroded trust in the sciences and governments in liberal democracies. From the Querdenker in Germany to QAnon in the United States, conspiracy theories have flourished on the internet and carried into public space. We not only live in a pandemic, but an infodemic, where we are inundated with information that strengthen national and cultural divides, and which eventually affect how we relate to strangers, institutions, and the world around us. Hong Kong has not been spared in this crisis of trust, as our speaker will show through the Edelman Trust Barometer. Since 2019, business brands have met unprecedented challenges, so Adrian will argue, economic uncertainty, geopolitical tensions, a global pandemic, and a crisis of gov governmentality. Uh, Hong Kong has experienced a two-year free fall since 2019 with uh, no trust in institutions, business, media, government, and I'm um, really excited uh, that uh, Adrian can share some very excellent data and research with us tonight. Trust has never been put to the test more than it has been this year. Can trust be restored? In particular, what are the opportunities for businesses and brands? So please let me introduce Mr. Adrian War, Managing Director of Edelman Hong Kong and tonight's esteemed speaker. Let's welcome Adrian. <laughs> Right. Switch on to that. Let's get rid of the charming picture of me and put up the slides instead. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Good evening. Good evening. Very good. I thought I was going to have to try maybe three or four times Saturday night, but you're all awake. That's a fabulous start. Uh, my name's Adrian, and I work at Edelman, which is a large communications firm. Uh, and I work here in Hong Kong, but I oversee Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Thailand. Uh, and I work across clients from all over Asia Pacific. I've been out here in Hong Kong for about eight years. And before that, I spent 15 years in London working in other agencies. And before that, worked in New York for a while. And before that, did what you're doing. And uh, was a student, not in communications, because I wasn't smart. I studied French and Italian, and then decided to move to China. So bad life decisions, but we'll come back to that later. I'm going to talk a little bit about Edelman, and then I'm going to go through our trust barometer, which is an incredibly interesting piece of research about trust and what makes people trust businesses, media, NGOs, and governments. I'll do a few case studies, just sort of three, mostly in the form of videos, just to give us something to talk about, and I'll open up for questions afterwards. So, just quickly by show of hands, who's heard of Edelman? Not bad. Okay, I won't fire our marketing team quite yet then. That was almost half of you. Good. Those that haven't heard of Edelman, we are a very big 
communications firm. Um, as you know, there are communications firms, PR firms, marketing firms, direct marketing firms, media firms, digital firms, creative firms. It's all a bit confusing. And there used to be very neat lines between them all and a much clearer differentiation. And clients would have different departments and different people for all of those different lines of activity. And gradually, we've started to kind of smooch them all together messily. So Edelman does a bit of advertising, a lot of digital marketing, a lot of public affairs, a lot of employee engagement, a lot of corporate communications, media relations, a bit of media buying. So we do all sorts. But I would say that our, our heritage is as a PR company, a communications company. There are a few things that make us a little bit different. The first is that we are both very big, but also independent. If any of you decide to go off and get a job in my kind of career, you'll look at various advertising agencies, marketing and digital and PR type agencies, and you'll find that they've all got nice value systems, nice principles, a beautiful logo, a nice office, but ultimately most of them are owned by four big companies, big, big holding companies, the vast majority. Um, and that's no bad thing, these holding companies serve a very good purpose, but they are listed and therefore their purpose in life is to deliver quarterly profits to shareholders. And that's fine. That serves a great purpose, it provides investment back into those businesses, but it does mean ultimately that the boss of your company is serving a mission which is to make investors richer, not necessarily to make your clients happier or you happier. Edelman is independent. It's owned by the Edelman family, and Richard Edelman, who is my boss, still runs the family, and his daughters work in a company. And so we are also a business. We're there to make money. We're there to make money for our, our shareholders, but our shareholders are essentially me and the employees. And because we're independent, we can therefore act in a slightly different way in the interests of our clients rather than just in the interest of profits. Although, believe me, we're very interested in profits too. What we do is we, we sell trust. You know, if I'd been a little bit cleverer and better at maths, I would have become an engineer and maybe sold cars or something useful like that. We don't, we don't have a product, we sell trust. It's a nebulous product and it's created by humans who are confusing and nebulous and hard to pin down as well. So it's a very odd business. We, we basically purvey ideas and we try and get people from different groups to understand each other better and maybe like each other and maybe trust each other which is a very interesting and creative business. And it takes you into all sorts of things like psychology, as well as all the stuff that you're doing around digital channels, statistics, data, and of course, how to use language. And I'll talk through in a bit this trust barometer. It'll make sense to you now perhaps why we do a trust barometer. If you're gonna sell a product to your clients and try and sell, get them to buy into trust, it is a good thing to understand what makes trust work to understand what it is you're gonna to sell to them that is gonna help them to achieve trust. So that's why we do all this research. What do we do? Do we do PR? Do we do advertising? Do we do digital marketing? Yes, we kind of do all of it. The point is what we try and come up with is ideas that people wanna talk about, right? And it's not just about coming up with an incredible campaign or something like that. Ultimately, it's about coming up with something that we know all of you are gonna, if you're the target audience, that all of you are going to immediately want to go and share on your Instagram feed or WhatsApp your mates about. That's really what we're doing, trying to do, get people talking and shape how they're talking. So, let's have a look at our trust barometer. Has anyone, here's going to be another show of hands, this will be a lot less accessible. Has anyone seen our trust barometer before? Oh, not bad. Okay. Excellent. Well, for the rest of you, you're going to love it. It's absolutely brilliant. But I'm going to start off just with a quick video because this research, we've been doing it for 21 years, and in Hong Kong, we've been doing it 10 years. And I'm going to show you some of that 10 years span. The research was conducted, uh, mainly this was conducted in October last year. So you were kind of looking at the year that we had the previous year. And it's September now, and that's even a lifetime ago. So I'm going to show a bit of a video. Just give you a recap of what was going on in the run-up to this happening. Watch me break the technology.
quick bit on the methodology, and I won't spend too much time on this because talking about methodology is very boring. Suffice to say, it's a very solid methodology. We've been doing it for 21 years. We do it in 28 markets. It's 33,000 respondents. It's not perfect because no research is perfect. If you're going to look at something as hard to pin down as trust and do it in that many countries, you're going to end up with something that's very broad and a little bit shallow. But that's fine. It's enough for us to be able to make some interesting judgments. And what we have is data that tells us the direction that things are going. It just doesn't necessarily diagnose why. So when we look at the data here in Hong Kong, it'll tell us what's happening with trust. We don't look into specific individuals in government and why they're trusted or not. Okay? In the research, you'll see these pyramids coming up occasionally. Informed public versus uh, general population or mass population. It, it's a useful thing to separate these people out for a number of reasons. They have been a lead indicator in the past, but also just because we've seen for seven, eight years now this huge polarization in society around all sorts, primarily probably a wealth divide, but around all sorts of other factors that are driving wedges between these communities and society. And so we separate them out because it is very interesting to see this divergence of trust between the people at the top of the pyramid and the rest. If you don't, you end up with the results looking really quite average. When you look at them separately, We've started this back in 2001, and this year's research, we called it Declaring Information Bankruptcy, because we're headline writers, so we come up with funny titles like that that sound snazzy. It's actually a, coal it's a sort of coalescence of lots of um, previous themes that we've seen in the research. If you look back at 2005, shifts from authorities to peers. That year, we saw lots of data telling us how people had started to move away from trusting figures of authority, trusting people in government, trusting professors, sorry, uh, trusting just people who are higher up in their business, CEOs, trusting people who are NGOs. And instead, we were beginning more to trust each other, peers, which makes sense, right? The rise of social media, we start listening to everyone else that's around us. We start slightly questioning the information that's been fed to us, and we think, hang on, we're getting this information from big business all of these years, should we trust it? Because now we've got transparency, now we have more information, now we can Google things ourselves. So we saw this big rise of people starting to distrust authority and trust their peers instead. In uh, 2016, we saw growing inequality of trust. That was tapping into a m very much discussed theme at the time of populism, of this polarization in society, and how people were beginning to live in specific groups separated from each other with different viewpoints on the world. And then in 2018, we had uh, our survey was about the battle for truth, which is around the fear of fake information, fake news, and the rise of people stopping trusting each other because they're not really sure whether they're getting the right information on social media anymore. When we put all these themes together, we arrive at where we are de declaring information bankruptcy. Not only have we lost trust in figures of authority, not only have we lost trust in the, the governments that are meant to be representing us all over the world, we're also now beginning to lose trust in social media and search and the people that are around us. And the group of people that we're trusting is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and closer to home. And the nature of those that wish to take advantage of that system means that we have massive misinformation and for all of us, there's just a growing sense of, I don't know who to trust, and I don't know where to get my information. And that's why we've called this year's data information bankruptcy. We kind of need to shake the etch sketch None of you would have had an etch sketch but we need to start fresh again and try and work out a different system for how we can all communicate with each other and build trust. So let's look at the state of trust overall. We look at trust in four different institutions. We look at media, NGOs, government, and business. If you take the average of all four of those, you get this, the trust index. This lists each country based on their level of trust across the four institutions. And the question that we ask at this stage in the survey is, do you trust business to do the right thing? Do you trust NGOs to do the right thing? Do you trust government to do the right thing? People answer that on a scale of one to 10. We take the average, and this is what you get. This is not saying that China is a better place to live than Brazil, 
or that Canada is considerably better than Japan. It's not like that. You can't compare one country to another. It doesn't work. The nuances, the philosophy, the ways of thinking, even just linguistics of the word trust are subtly different in every language, so you really can't compare country to country. Instead, what you're looking at is how each country moves up and down each year, or what's going on within the country's over trend. So you'll see this year two interesting ones. China dropped 10 points from 82 to 72 this year. Significant drop in trust. Very understandable given a global pandemic. And also, by the way, 72 is still a staggering high level of trust. The US is a big loser. Over the last few years, it's down at 48 there. We actually did a second survey because this was in the field when the election was happening. So we did one just as the election was ending and it dropped six points, which puts the US as one of the least trusted in the world. And that's been the case since the president before this one. It's not a pretty picture in Hong Kong, I'll be honest. If you look at the global average, you've got trust in business, NGOs, government and media across the top. And across the bottom, you've got Hong Kong. Okay? And you can see globally, business is the most trusted. It's in blue. Those gray ones, that means it's neutral. Anything from 50 to 60 is neutral. It means people are kind of eh, half trusting. In Hong Kong, there is no trusted institution. That's a concern. So there's this sort of vacuum of trust. People don't quite know who to turn to. Also interesting. It is very easy for us in Hong Kong from the last few years to look at this and think, oh, this is all a government problem, or this is all political. There are, in this study, 11 markets that have lower levels of trust in government than Hong Kong, including my country, the UK. However, trust in business, only Russia is lower than Hong Kong in trust in business. So the staggering and worrying thing in this data is not necessarily trust in government, it's trust in business. This is a business capital of the world. It is known as being a supposedly liberalized, westernized business capital of the world. There is no good reason why trust in businesses should be so low, and that is a concerning thing. You can see here the four institutions trended, and you'll see there was a big bump back in 2018 after Carrie Lam came into power. You always get a bump in trust when you get a new leader. We have this weird sense of optimism of, oh, yes, there's someone new. Everything's going to be different. And then within a year, it's, oh, everything's the same. <laughs> Happens the world over. Um, nothing to do with the leader or the individual. It's just the nature of human beings. We get excited about change, and then we realize change doesn't happen that much. You see a big drop in trust across uh, media, NGOs. Um, government over the years, a downward trend. But again, look at business. There is no in this study where business is the least trusted institution so continuously and with such low levels. Again, it's a very worrying thing because what we're going to come on to do is we have a contention which is that one of the biggest problems here is people's fear for their own livelihood. And if business is not trusted, we're therefore fearing for our own livelihoods and our future and our jobs and our kids' jobs as well. So this is a huge problem. Obviously, it goes hands in hands with well-documented negative perceptions around social stability, and economic indicators. Right? People fundamentally are worried about their ability to feed themselves, have a roof over their head, buy nice clothes, go on a holiday, well, well if only one day. But the economic concerns here are significant, and we believe there's a lot in this data that tells us that the issues of trust here in Hong Kong, while they may have been catalyzed by political, geopolitical events, their persistent low level of trust, we think, has much more to do with the wonky economic situation here and people's fear over their economic future. Let's talk about the pandemic briefly. I'm just going to do a couple of things on a pandemic because you're probably bored of hearing about it. There's two things that have come out as a result of the pandemic that relate to trust. The first is, obviously, everyone's worried about their jobs. So 51% of people say that as a result of the pandemic, a portion of our workforce has either had their hours reduced or their jobs eliminated. More than half of people work in a company where they or people they're working with have lost or had their job reduced. That's a staggering amount. That's a lot of people who are really, really worried. And 
even with a global pandemic, generally speaking, we're more worried about losing our jobs than getting COVID. Sort of makes sense. But here in Hong Kong, we're much more worried about that than globally. So the global gap between job loss versus contracted COVID, 19 points, the Hong Kong gap, 31. Who knows? That could be a greater fear of job loss. It could be the economics. It could, I think, also be a reflection of the fact that we feel, compared to lots of other markets around the world, that the pandemic has been managed, frankly, pretty well here, if you look at the numbers. Another thing that's been creeping through the data, again, correlated to, but probably not caused by the pandemic, is an increasing awareness of the social divides in Hong Kong and the haves and have nots, and the need to bridge that gap. The pandemic has certainly highlighted inequality and our need to address it. So let's talk about the infodemic, this raging, massive information coming from all sorts of channels with lots of people with vested interest shouting polarized arguments, not listening to each other, bucket loads of fake news and geopolitical division. And we're all sitting there with all of this information thinking, well, who do I trust and who do I listen to? And we've continued to stop trusting voices of authority. We've continued to trust less in experts but we're also now trusting a bit less in our peers and social media. There's been a shift in the things that people are prioritizing, which is a good indication of this challenge with the infodemic. So people who say that these things are more important since the, uh, the start of the year in Hong Kong, 61% say finding ways to combat fake news has become more important to them. But it's these ones in the middle that I think are really interesting, increasing my own information literacy and increasing my science literacy have become priorities for me since the beginning of the year. People are feeling like they need to learn a lot more because they're not trusting the information that they've got to get. Whereas they may have trusted a national newspaper or the TV to tell them what they needed to know before, they're now thinking, well, I need to learn about this myself because I've got to go verify that. So people are questioning. Maybe that's a good thing. This comes at a time when, unfortunately, media is seen to be less competent and less ethical than it has been. In simple terms, people don't trust what they're reading. They don't trust the news. 54% of people think journalists and reporters are purposely trying to mislead people by saying things they know are false or gross exaggerations. 60% of people say most news organizations are more concerned with supporting an ideology or a political position than informing the public. And 68%, a six point increase since last year, say the media is not doing well at being objective and non-partisan. Shocking stats, slightly naive stats in some ways as well, in that the media has never been good at being objective. <laughs> That's not really what it's been there to do. We tend to have a slightly naive conversation, especially in the West, about our free media. Our media isn't free, it's commercialized, it's there to sell. It puts out news that gets eyeballs, not news that is accurate. We probably should have known that for a very long time, but we've perhaps turned a blind eye to it and become more aware. But certainly, we distrust we are less trusting of traditional media. If you break down the media a bit more, and by the way, I hate this, it should be way more sophisticated. We should look at different forms of social. We should look at different platforms. This is a blunt instrument, but if you've got to do 28 countries, you kind of have to simplify. So we look at traditional media, search engines, owned media, and social media. And you can see there's, there's broadly a sort of downwards trend in everything. 47% now for traditional media, but let me just point something out because context is everything. It's low and it's tumbled from 76, but actually 47% trust in media is staggering compared to most other countries with a really thriving media landscape such as we have here. UK trust in media is about 30%, French is about 33. So 47 is still relatively high. I would look at that and actually say, what the hell was it doing at 76% before? I mean, that's a staggering figure. In very few societies would you ever have found commercialized media getting 76% trust. So I think that's a correction in some ways. What is pleasing in some ways is that people are recognizing uh, the, the risks around search and social considerably more. I think people are now much more educated on the need to verify information a bit more, although we'll come on to the fact that even though we're aware we're still not actually displaying any information hygiene. 
And it's not just the sources, it's actually the people who are the spokespeople as well. They're all becoming less trusted. All of these positions of authority are being less and less trusted. Again, government official is the only one that's gone up this year from 29 to 37. And if you look at the 10 year trend, you can see it's probably not time for them to pop open champagne corks either. It's still a downwards trend over the last decade. But down on pretty much everything, even, even a person like yourself, the top line, which was at 67%, has come down to 55. It's an interesting thing that, if you think about it, do you trust a person like yourself? And we're saying less so. That's a stark judgment on how depressingly antitrust we all are at the moment. And here's the kicker. We are all part of the problem. We'd love to talk about this and pretend that it's other people out there that are doing it. No, we are part of the problem. Who here, in the last month, by show of hands, has shared a piece of news on social media or um, any messaging platform? A few. Okay, I certainly have. Did you verify the information before you shared it? Did you source check it? Good, nods up there. Most of us don't. Most of us are living in relatively no, low news engagement environments, i.e. we're reading two publications that we've decided we trust, and we're not looking at other publications. We don't like to use multiple sources. Most of us are staying within the same sort of channels and platforms where we're not getting access to other bits of news that we might get, and where we're controlled by algorithms that are feeding us news based on what we've read before. Most of us are not verifying information, and um, most of us will amplify information very happily, even if it's controversial. In fact, the more controversial, the more likely we are to share it. And so we're all amplifying this misinformation. So you've got 16% of people who do three out of four of any of those things on any given day. And if you've got 54% of people who are sharing or forwarding news, but only 16% of them are actually verifying it and have good information hygiene, then the rest of that, you're all basically misinformation super spreaders. We're pumping out confusing, misleading content all over the place. So we are the problem, not necessarily anyone else. And that matters in all sorts of ways, but just one example of poor information hygiene correlating to other issues. If you have poor information hygiene, you are statistically less likely to want to go and get vaccinated. There's all sorts of other correlations as well that are not particularly useful or, or positive. And in all of this, you might be surprised to know, the one place where trust is strong is in the workplace. What we're finding, especially around things like the pandemic, but even things around politics, is when we're struggling to believe what's being given to us by the news or by experts or on social media, we're listening to our employer and we're trusting them an awful lot, which is great news for me as an employer. Um, but whilst we trust our own CEOs and the people that work within our own company, we don't trust anyone else's CEOs. So 53% of people say business leaders are purposely trying to mislead people, saying things that they know are false or gross exaggerations, and that shoots up 61% for people under 34. So what's this mean for business? Well, you've got declining trust in business. We look at business as well. This is another interesting little uh, slide. We look at trust in businesses based on where they're domiciled. This is what people in Hong Kong think of German companies, English companies, US companies, Chinese companies. The most trusted company domiciles are Switzerland and Canada in Hong Kong, in case you're interested. But all country, businesses from all countries essentially are experiencing a bit of a downward trend or just very low levels of trust. So what can they do about it? Expectations within businesses are pretty simple. It's protect my job. The expectation is I want you to make sure that you can keep paying me and I can keep my job. Expectations outside the company, considerably different. 56% um, of people think that a company can and should take specific actions both to increase profits and to improve the social and economic conditions of the markets in which it operates, i.e., great, you can make money, you're a business, you should be making money, but I need you also to be improving society where you operate. That's a big leap. Any of you that study business or know anything about business would understand that that's actually impossible for a listed company. 
because their mandate is absolutely not to do that. They're answerable to their shareholders, not to the country in which they operate. And in a world of business that's globalized, how can you do that in the same way for every market? There's different regulators everywhere. So it is a slightly different, a slightly difficult expectation for businesses to live up to. It gets even tougher for CEOs. These expectations, again, make you understand why a lot fewer people want to be CEOs these days. 69% of people think CEOs should step in when the government does not fix societal problems. Just let that sink in for a second, because it's crazy. I mean, that's literally bonkers, right? But we actually believe it. We think that, well, governments are rubbish, they're not doing a great job, it's time for business to step in. Fine, but businesses don't have that mandate, nor are they trained to do it. 66% of people think CEOs should take the lead on change rather than waiting for government to impose change. Think about that from a business point of view. Don't care if there's any regulation or not. You need to do it without being regulated. That's the expectation. 59% think CEOs should hold themselves accountable to the public and not just to the board of directors or shareholders. Again, bonkers. Imagine what the world would be like if that's actually how business operated. It's impossible. And yet these are the expectations. So we have this kind of massive chasm between what we expect businesses to do and what they're actually set up to do. And that, I think, is part of the problem in how businesses are failing to gain trust of public. So it's this mismatch of expectations. If the expectations are this high, how can businesses gain trust? And it's made all the more difficult with crazy expectations such as, just, you know, don't let any of your jobs go, which is, imp again, impossible for business. 82% think CEOs should be speaking out on one of these issues. Now, what's interesting here is pandemic impact, job automation, these things make a lot of sense. Protests, civil unrest, fulfillment of media's responsibilities, societal issues, eh. Kind of hard for business to take a stand on these things. What, what we've seen over the years with um, corporate social responsibility, we've seen a gradual evolution from it being businesses being attacked by NGOs for doing bad stuff to businesses preempting that by having a CSR policy where they try not to do any harm to businesses moving into, let's do this proactively and see if we can be good for society and do a Unilever and have a triple bottom line. What you're now seeing, actually, is political activism amongst uh, business leaders. So they've stepped out of just even just doing CSR. If you imagine, well, you wouldn't remember this, actually, but back when Donald Trump first became president, he announced a crazy immigration ban. And within 24 hours of announcing that immigration ban, the CEOs of Apple and Google had come out and issued a public statement saying we disagree with this. Apple and Google commenting on US immigration. There is n they, that has nothing to do with their license to operate. It's a very, very significant shift in how businesses are seeing their role in civil society. The biggest thing that businesses can do to gain trust is it's playing this role of being a guardian of accurate information. It's telling us what we need to know. It's helping us cut through all of this confusing noise and understand what we should be listening to. So... In summary, it's really bad. <laughs> Trust is in free fall. It's in a bad place all over the world. But we're just generally, we're in a pretty bad place because we're naturally, as a species, a little bit distrusting. We're tribal. We tend to form into groups, and we tend to fear and dislike the other. What we've done is we've created structures and now technology that are amplifying some of those worst instincts of human nature. What we need to do now is work out how we can take those same technologies and structures and turn them over so they actually work in the other way and encourage the better side of our natures. What I want to do now is talk through a few case studies of some of the work that we've done. We've only got four minutes, so I'm just going to do two of them. So I'm going to skip that one and do this one. I'm going to show a couple of videos and just talk through why we're doing this kind of work and how it relates to trust. Oatly is a provocative brand driving the shift in society towards a plant-based diet. Already established in the West, they were launching in Hong Kong, but they had problems. In Hong Kong, when someone says milk, people think cow. Alarmingly, 
although 90% of the native population are lactose intolerant, consumption of dairy milk was increasing. Oatly needed to raise awareness and generate debate. In Cantonese, however, there is no word for plant milk. It can't be written or said, so how can we talk about it? We did something no other brand has dared to do. We took the formidable 2,000-year-old Cantonese language and we changed it, introducing the new word nai, which fuses the character for milk with the character for plants. Here in Hong Kong, Oatly's trying to educate shoppers. They introduced the Chinese character for plant-based milk, creating a new category for the grocery aisle. The new word was launched to local and international media with public events, attended by influencers in the green community, who then spread the message. Print and outdoor ads prominently displayed the new word, and supermarkets even adopted it for point of sale. Suddenly, everyone could talk about the new idea. And talk they did. So now we have a lot more people drinking plant milk, and because of the new word, we can finally begin important debates. So Oatly is now calling for plant milk legislation to give plant milk lovers the same protection as other consumers. Oatly, better for humans, better for the planet. So, case study kind of makes sense, right? So what does this have to do with trust? Um, I mentioned that people trust what they're getting through social media, through their own connections, and live in their own little echo chambers, right? Uh, what I didn't mention as well is there's been a, de a gradual decline in trust in traditional advertising. Uh, and it's also just much harder to get people's eyeballs onto traditional advertising. So if you're looking, like Oatly, at launching a new product into a market, and you want to get lots of people to drink your delicious new uh, oat milk, you're going to need to reach them and persuade them in the most effective possible way that's also low cost. The traditional model would be to buy a bucket load of advertising, get it on TV, get it on billboards, and get people to go and try your product. And that's great if your product is, say, a new burger at McDonald's, because you kind of know what we're gonna try and we know what to experience. If you have a product that has an established zero level or, or negative level of trust, i.e. if there is skepticism, of, oh, I'm not sure I want that. Is that cow's milk? How do you make milk out of oats? If there is skepticism of a product, it's not gonna work, is it? You're gonna buy a bucket load of advertising for people to say, no, nah, not for me. So you've gotta get people to actually try it. If you need to get people from apathy to action, the most effective way of doing it is getting their peers to tell them. Peer pressure or peer communications is way more effective and trusted than anything else. To do that, you need to get people talking on social media. To get people talking on social media, you just have to come up with interesting content and something that people will want to do. And pretty much every time I show this video, I get the same reaction. The minute the character event goes up, everyone goes, mm -hmm. and that's all you need. That reaction means that's the kind of thing that some people in this room are likely to go, oh my God, have you seen this? And share it. Then people are gonna be a little bit more likely to try it. The second thing that's important about this campaign of recategorizing something is if people misassociate or don't understand your category, you need to recreate that category. This is literally renaming what's called in shopping terms an SKU, a stock keeping unit. It's renaming a line of sales. It takes them out of milk, takes them out of dairy, and puts them in a different place. So lots of subtle strategy behind what looks like just kind of a fun campaign and a fun idea and a fun event. There's a, the whole deal of thinking that goes into how we're gonna get people to try this stuff. Have a look at that one. So, last one, and then we'll go into Q and A's. Um, we work with Sunkist, who sell oranges and citrus fruit. And traditionally, what we do is we set up experiential events. So we set up spaces outside shopping malls and things like that, where we'll do fun stuff. Like we'll set up a beach, and we'll make you orange-based cocktails, and you can come and have a drink and sit there, and you might have a fake tanning lounge or something like that, and you'll be like, oh, well, this is really cool, on your way to go and do your shopping pandemic kicks in and you can't do events anymore. So we've had to try and shift into a much more digital sphere. Have a look at this case study. This is, I think, a really good example of shifting your marketing strategy to adjust to a different consumer context. In 2020, COVID-19 completely changed how we connect with one another. 
Whether it's traveling, sharing a meal, or spending time together, social distancing pushed us further apart than ever before. In Asia, Citrus Cooperative Sunkiss relies on experiential events to raise awareness of the brand and communicate its brand promise, share what's real. With all live events cancelled, how could we reach our millennial audience while the fruit was still in season? We identified that millennials were turning to online gaming and spotted an opportunity to bring our fresh California-grown citrus to the virtual world. We tapped into the explosive popularity of Animal Crossing and created the freshest new virtual destination, Sunkiss Island, a space where people could create new memories and enjoy the sense of community that's fundamental to the brand. Sunkiss Island welcomed gamers from Hong Kong, Singapore, and Japan, where they could tour our groves, model our fashionable orange and lemon-themed outfits, and take home vibrant citrus artwork to decorate their own island. Visitors flock to our island to join scavenger hunts and learn more about our in-season juicy California-grown citrus, and our sessions were sold out in minutes. And we didn't stop there. We also traveled to our audience's islands, leaving gifts of oranges and golden tools, with messages on their bulletin boards encouraging them to visit our website to discover our citrus-inspired recipes. And we shared content from Sunkiss Island on our social channels and with media outlets. Our results were pretty juicy. 1.4 million earned impressions. Coverage in Ad Age, Marketing Magazine, and Pace. 7.9 million social media impressions. 27,000 social media engagements. 5,000 website clicks. 70% month-on-month increase in page views. With Sunkiss Crossing outperforming all our previous physical events, we prove that you can share what's real in the virtual world. It's a very cute basic idea, right? It's, it's, if people aren't hanging around at shopping malls anymore because they can't, where are they hanging out? Oh, they seem to go on Animal Crossing? Let's go there. Uh, I don't play Animal Crossing, so I have no idea really whether it's that good, but uh, I'm told it's brilliant. We have two web builders in our office who, when putting this together, had to test it. They had to play Animal Crossing for about 76 hours straight just to test it, and they've never played it since. Um, it's a really good idea in terms of, again, trust. Trust is one of these things that you'd love to think is rational. But as with most things human, it's a lot less rational than you think it might be. When people are playing a game like Animal Crossing and giving up a significant amount of time to do so, there's this sort of psychological commitment and an affinity that you build with that brand and that game. You start to trust it. You may not necessarily think about this. It's probably odd for you to think that if you played Animal Crossing, you trust that game, but you actually just do. You start to have a positive disposition towards this game. So when brands pop up in it, they benefit from what we call a halo effect. They're essentially, because they're in that platform, they now gain the trust that you've already established with that platform. So it's a very, very good way of sneaking in trust through the back door by putting yourself in a place where people are already positively predisposed to whatever they're doing. Anyway, I've gone over six minutes, so, sorry, 50 minutes, so I'm going to stop there uh, and open up for q and I hope you found that useful. If you would like to know more about our trust barometer, you can go to our website and you can download, I think, 21 years' worth of reports from 28 countries. Uh, and if you do, you're a much more boring person than even me, but you can, and it's all there to look at. I'm showing you the Hong Kong data today. There's fantastic data from China, from all over Asia as well. We've got um, 28 markets worth of it. So please do go and have a look. It's all free. We create it and give it to the industry. You can use it in your studies. You might find as you're going through your courses that you're looking for interesting research on data. Please feel free, on, on trust, sorry. Please feel free to steal it. If you'd like to know more about Edelman, then you can come and ask me afterwards. Um, otherwise, thank you very much for your attention. Fun, actually. Thank you, Adrian. Time flies. That's always, I think, the recipe for a good lecture when you know that the power, the hour has passed and you didn't get bored. So thank you very much for this very informative and deep and entertaining talk. Um, I know that you guys have um, a lot of questions and also, I mean, I didn't really introduce the bio um, of, of Adrian in the beginning because I wanted to leave it for now that we are sitting in this more intimate setting and give you like 30 seconds to think about your questions. 
Um, but Adrian, he pointed to that in the beginning. He's a very experienced communication specialist, and actually that should appeal to all of you because I think many of you of the young faces and the older ones maybe in the room um, aspire to be communication specialists, and he has worked in London, New York, and now, of course, here in Hong Kong. But I just also want to kind of very, very briefly, so you can think about your questions, really think about and, and talk about the companies he has been working with, and that really includes HSBC, Cathay, Mars, Kofi Annan, right, Jerry Blair, and the Princess Christina of Spain. Now, that was also quite impressive. He has worked with Samsung, Google, eBay, Coca, Tencent, Pepsi, um, Warner Music, and so on, KPMG. And I'm just kind of saying that also to kind of increase your trust in Adrian as a speaker, <laughs> because, um, you know, just by the pure kind of gesture of our, uh, you know, ourselves inviting you. But I think it's a very impressive one. And also, he is um, on the board of the Hong Kong International Literary Festival. Um, so I think this is really something that uh, shows how, you know, uh, his impressive um, kind of bio and um, also what you can do if you want to become a communication specialist in the future. But without further ado, I would like to open the floor now so you can ask questions. Please make use of the remaining 30 minutes. This is a really rare opportunity. So, any questions? Yes, we have the first one there. And we have our helpful um, staff here who will go around with microphones. So please wait until you have the microphone. Please ask a short question. Um, and then Adrian. Uh, hi, Hello. Adrian. Thank you for sharing today. Uh, it was really informative. So I have a question about the trust barometer study. So it's really funny to see that um, Hong Kong has an all-time low of trust in businesses. But then, like on the other side, we can also see people are expecting the companies and their CEOs to do a lot of things to like take care of the society and stuff like that. So what kind of implications can we draw from this surprising result? Oh, it's a good question. I mean, there's so many answers to it. I mean, I think one of the first things to bear in mind is that there is a difference between, that there's just this, this big, research is a funny thing because People don't tend to actually think how they feel or say what they think or do what they say, actually. Um, so you, you have to kind of take those kind of statements and interpret them. If, if it were true that I would stop trusting any business because of all those things, we'd be in a desperately bad state and I wouldn't be able to find a job anywhere. These are expectations that are growing. They're not necessarily demands and there is a huge amount of nuance as to what you will let companies get away with or what matters to you personally or how much you'll bend. So we know that employees, for instance, are way more belief-driven right now. But we also know that a 25% pay rise will do an awful lot to offset my not-so-great carbon emissions or something else like that. So I think it's important to sort of contextualize this as this is, if you're a business looking to really build trust, these are some of the levers that you can pull. It doesn't mean if you're a business that isn't knocking all of this out of the park that you're rubbish. That's just not the case. Most businesses, mine included, are not able to live up to all of these kind of expectations. So I think it sort of needs interpretation. <coughs> but a more sort of direct answer to this. What businesses need to do is a bunch of things, actually. First off, a higher level of courage for getting a bit of a kicking when you say something. Most businesses operate off a, we want zero negativity. That's our benchmark, we want zero negativity, so we're gonna, if that's our guiding light, we're gonna make all of our decisions on how we communicate based on zero negativity. That, I think, in this day and age is, is impossible and stupid. I think businesses need to understand that whatever they do, there's gonna be people over there that hate it and people over there that love it, and a bunch of people in the middle that are going, and you can't just be tilting at windmills because of those. And yet most businesses are. If you look at businesses um, here in Hong Kong, businesses in the US, businesses um, all over the world, I think, 
they are mostly keeping their heads down and staying away from the things that we all care a lot about. Now, if I, as a business, want to build trust with you, I need to understand what matters to you, and I need to be able to understand how to address it. Dealing only with what matters to me and I feel safe talking about is not going to work. I like to think about a lot of these things in communications a bit like just making a really awkward sort of round conversation. If you and I are having dinner and you want to talk about K-pop and all I bang on about is, is UK politics, we're not going to have a very good conversation and there will be zero level of trust. Same applies, right? If businesses are only going to talk about themselves and what matters to them, they're never really going to build better trust with their audiences. The other thing I think that businesses need to get better at doing, and I won't go on too long because this is I could talk all night long on that question, um, is I think a higher level of linguistic empathy. Um, businesses still use language, channels, and just modes of communication that are desperately stilted and inhuman. They don't talk like people talk anymore. Language is a fiercely complicated and weird thing, right? You think that what's happening is I'm conceptualizing something in my head. I turn it into words. I say those words. Those words go in your head, and exactly the same thoughts pop up. That's a lovely way of thinking about it, but it's just not what happens, right? I mean, for a start, if I imagine looking at this room, what my eyes are taking in is a vast array of information, a huge amount of information. You know, I'm taking in lights that are up there, I'm taking in movement in my peripheral vision, I'm taking in all sorts of colours, I've got a perfect sense of depth that tells me how far away from you are, I can see lots and lots of colours, I can even sense, you know, noise, all sorts of other stuff. When I turn it into words, you know, it's like, it's like I've taken super high definition, massive multicolour information into my brain, and when I'm tapping it out, it's like Morse code. Communication is massively inefficient through most forms of language, and that's why we do clever things like creating emojis and using pictures and using videos. They communicate an awful lot more. Businesses still tend to rely on a faceless statement, a few words here and there, a website. They're not communicating in the way that we communicate with each other. The world has moved on, and we're all communicating in a very, very different way, and businesses are still using old models, and that means that we find them very hard to relate to, and therefore we can't trust them. Those are two of the things I'd draw out. If you've got six or seven hours, another time I can tell you another 30 or 40 things. But mm -hmm. Any other questions? Any other questions? Just worth noting as well, I hope you appreciate how appropriate my pitch was for someone who's an advertising communication. <laughs> so I like what you see on the menu at McDonald's and what you actually get when you buy your McDonald's. <laughs> Thank you for the great sharing. Um, I will, I'm excited because I will be joining Element soon. Um, so I have a question. So, um, so how does Element or um, communicators in gen general reshape brands which um, are s uh, to rebuild trust, who, uh, brands that are already like the Oh my God, I'm so, so nervous, I'm sorry. Um, Crisis brands, you mean? Yeah, brands, brands that, that their trust are already uh, damaged or just general because they have the constraint of, for example, their major investors, uh, majority, for example, um, as shown in the PowerPoint presentation just now, some of the brand who are, for example, politically, they are already the major investors, they have certain limitation in terms of rebuilding trust. How can they reshape the brand or even to become thought leaders with these constraints? Yeah. yeah. So how do you repair trust for uh, damaged brands and brands that have limitations with, with orders? Yeah, that's a good question. There's no one set way. There's one process, which is you try and understand what people think about that brand. So you try and understand all the different audiences and what they think. And then you look at the commercial requirements. Lots of companies don't need to be trusted by the general public. Goldman Sachs does not really need to be trusted by the general public. That's why Goldman Sachs does not say very much. Goldman Sachs needs to be trusted by governments, by its business customers, by its high net worth customers, and those people really do trust Goldman Sachs. So part of it is about understanding, yes, what people think, but actually it's about going to the core of what is your business need. Now. Let's say you are Cathay Pacific right now, right? 
then you've got a significant challenge. Full disclosure, a client of mine for a very long time, absolutely love them, um, feel desperately sorry for them, but let's face it, they've, they've made a few mistakes, they've had some significant challenges, and I would say they are a brand that has a very low level of trust, uh, generally speaking. How do you go about repairing a, a trust in a brand like that? That's a very, very tough kind of gig, because um, you've got, You've got, to, you've got to essentially understand the nature of how a brand works and how we relate to a brand. People absolutely love, generally speaking, flying on cafe globally. Global customers do. Those who have come from the US or, or like me who've spent time in Europe, you appreciate how amazingly good that airline is. Similar, by the way, for MTR here. Everyone here hates MTR. You try living in London for 15 years, you will love the MTR. And so context is everything. So for a lot of people, the customer experience is absolutely fantastic. What uh, is a trouble for that particular brand is that they have caught themselves enmeshed in some political issues, and they have, I think, a significant challenge on the relationship between management, the vast majority of their workforce, and the public. Those three points are not connected very well. So I think, um, how can you rebuild trust in a brand like that? Ultimately, it's gonna be a long process of engagement, and in their case, starting first with employees. One of the biggest drivers of trust, when we're looking at a company and deciding whether we trust them or not, one of the biggest drivers these days is how they treat their employees. That was never the case, like 100 years ago, because no one knew how you treated your employees. Unless they had a union or they went on strike, nobody knew, there was no social media. You could treat them basically any way you wanted, and it wouldn't be a factor for your external reputation. Nowadays, it's like glass door, it's like etc. How you are as an employer is constantly visible to actually everyone, and it's a very big benchmark for how we trust a company. Because what we do is we see glass door, and we imagine ourselves in that job, or we imagine our friend Steve in that job, and so it immediately personalizes that experience. So how you treat your employees is a huge driver. So in their case, you would focus very, very hard on the relationship between employee and employee. Employer branding, you would look at employer value proposition, which is kind of the emotional and rational contract between an employer and an employee. And you gradually try and improve it. And it will take a very long time. When you're shifting trust with a group that's that big, it'll be a little bit like pulling a heavy brick with an elastic band. Nothing's going to happen for a while and it's going to suddenly start shifting and it will improve. But you're talking about a three or four year delay potentially for a significantly change in the relationship. So that's with them. You know, you mentioned investors. There are lots of companies, I would say, HSBC has been one of them, who've had relatively good levels of trust at periods, but very bad with investors. Where they've been worried that, you know, you might have access to investors saying, you need to invest more in this market, or spend less on that, or move more into retail, or where's your insurance business? So again, you're going to target an opportunity as a business. But the challenge that you get with most difficult brands in crisis most of the time, um, is, again, this is human nature. People don't like to pay to prepare for a crisis. You can. Because if you're running a business, it's pretty much guaranteed that at some point, you're going to have some sort of employee issue. You're going to get called out for being hacked on for ENR. There are two types of companies in this world, those who have been hacked, and those that don't know they've been hacked, so you can have a side crisis. All companies can prepare for these things, about 5% of them. When a crisis happens, and it's too late to deal with it, and they hire people like me to come in and expensively tell them what to do, and then after three weeks of paying me to do that, they send us away, and they think that that will be done, and that everyone will forget, and things will get better. That's the usual anatomy of crisis management, and it's absolutely the worst. It's a bit like my form of dieting, which is where I eat far too much over Christmas, starve myself for a couple of weeks in January, feel dreadful, and then eat fatter for the rest of the year. It's, it's the exact opposite of what you should do, but it's just human nature again. What a smart company should do is get prepared in advance, and you won't need to hire a crisis agency to come in and manage a crisis, and then actually spend a lot of time and effort and money on brand recovery, not on crisis management. Spend the money over here to make things better, rather than trying to manage it when it's really, really bad. Another long answer. Good question. Thank you. Anissa, that's the next question. Mm. I just want to push that question a little bit further um, into a different arena. I mean, almost the same question, but yeah. in, in, the, in the political, in the government institution, all right? And it's kind of shocking, I mean, to f discover that 
the business arena has less trust than the government in the past two years in Hong Kong. I was expecting the government to be the first. And uh, when the government is trying to revamp or repair the damaged image, I mean, not many companies are interested. Uh, a lot of PR companies have pulled out. Consulum is, is the one that was like taking it for $46 million, trying to rebrand the government, right? And I just want to push that question into the government arena. I mean, is that possible? I mean, um, what are the dynamics, you know, are they, you know, similar to the business that you're talking about? You know, because I don't see the employers, you know, uh, properly treated these days in the government. Um, you know, and, and the empathy that you're talking about with the public, with the people, mm. that it's ruling. I mean, the stakeholders are a little bit different and the dynamics are a little bit different. I just want to listen to Really, what what do you think? What is that any any way possible to repair the Hong Kong government? I mean, if if we want to, but wow. yeah, that's yeah, a good question. question. So, Nick, I mean, um, the, the the short answer, by the way, is I don't know. Um, I'll tell you something about politicians. And I've worked, so I, I've been lucky enough to dot around in communications, doing. I was a publicist for celebrities and you know fun, high-profile people, um, which is great fun, but a bit weird, done high profile politicians, done business, uh, done NGOs. Politicians have it hardest. Um, people love to hate politicians, right? There's just a default position. And I think it's been built, it, it's amazing. I think it's, I think it's, we experience this as we grow up. We see it in popular media. We see it in the media which is surrounded by it. That's just a default position that we love knocking politicians. They are always portrayed as nasty, untrustworthy, difficult people. Um, and it's the nature of most politics, whether you are a democracy or not, that you would have different factions that argue different cases, and therefore you have people that are always taking sides. The nature of communications through traditional media and others, again, plays very much that. We all love stories, right? And stories tend to have goodies and baddies. They tend to have stakes, some kind of challenge, and then a resolution. That's the kind of formula we love for a story. Politicians is a little bit like that, but it's always sort of negative stories. It's naturally made for stories. We have goodies and baddies. We have people that we want to see win or lose. Um, and I think the nature, again, the nature of traditional media, which has for a long time driven a political agenda for the public, because we don't tend to watch what they're actually debating in wherever they debate. We read about it in the newspaper the next day. So the popular discourse on politics is driven by newspaper correspondents and TV correspondents generally. Um, they live in a world, certainly in the Western world, where they're trying to sell copy, not give you an accurate political view of what's going on. They're trying to sell as many bits of paper or get as many clicks as they possibly can. And that means that they will always sway towards the polemical. They will always sway towards the story that's going to make you rub a neck and turn around and go, oh, that's disgusting. Because the, you're, you're, you know, we, you're sort of, yes, you're selling content, but if you think about newspapers, it's a really odd thing. It used to be easy to think about newspapers, the hard copy. Now you're selling words in a digital arena. Well, you're not, again, you're not actually doing it. The same as what I'm doing here, that you're selling emotions, right? And newspapers tend to sell outrage and fear. It's very strong, they sell that. And I think that is a reason why the political debate is such as it is, is unable to be more rational, because it's driven by our desires, our human nature, um, which is to focus on the stuff that annoys us, the stuff that outrages us, and not necessarily balance and nuance. So I think politicians get it very, very hard. I think there's another difficult thing, which is, generally speaking, business leaders, in, in my experience, tend to be very good communicators, but want to do it as little as possible, and politicians tend to be dreadful communicators and want to do it as much as possible. Um, there's an awful lot about politicians that's hard to like. And that, I think, is bred from the fact that it's very hard to be a politician. If you sit with a journalist, if you're doing even an event like this, if you're a politician, you're coming into this expecting to be hijacked. She's the default position, as I know. That's going to make you behave in a certain way. It's going to make you behave defensively from the officer. So, look, I think there's, there's a whole bunch going on around the communications of politicians. As far as policies go and politics and whether Hong Kong government can restore trust, I, I think that goes beyond communications of our expertise. If you imagine when BP had a massive oil spill uh, in the Gulf, 
people say, oh, it's communication nightmare. Yeah, but actually it's not. It's an oil coming out of ground now. That's the price. And until the oil stops coming out of ground, no amount of communication is going to fix that. I think it's a similar thing here. This is not a communication for the trust problem. This is a political problem. This is a divide of society. And I think it's easy to say, well, the politicians are doing a bad job. No, we're all in it. We all live by it. And things will change when strength fades. And there's all sorts of geopolitical factors. Globalization potentially going to overshift in that, or large economies shifting and how they seem to be previous relationships. I think it is interesting how much of the time that money. You've got a generation of dying that understood and experienced the Second World War. That, that has a big difference between your opinion. That's why you're anti like Brexit. You want to turn out because the network is here and everyone else will go on Well, all of these changes going on here mean the world is dynamically possibly in a better way. I'm saying that it's just. Thank you. Important question. There's a question from the lady in red. Uh, so hi, Adrian. Um, thank you for all the wonderful information. So uh, my question is kind of related to what you just said, uh, but specific, specifically regarding the uh, news outlet. So as we all know, uh, the news outlet choose to uh, put out all those fake news or do all those uh, news manipulation or put out all those sensational or uh, sensational pieces because they are profit driven or um, they have their political concern. Uh, I'm not saying that there's no good news outlet out there, I know there, but just in general, when it's not like a specific brand or product, but it's a whole industry that have our trust broken, how do we like rebuild that trust? Yeah, specifically in, in traditional media or media across the board? Uh, traditional media. Yeah, traditional, so I mean, the, the big problem, right, is a uh, global big problem is uh, the internet and specifically social media companies. And I'll try not to start ranting because I do start a bit on social media companies, but they are dangerously bad because they've not been controlled. And what you've had historically is media has played a very significant role in society. It's not just something that we buy because we like it. It actually really plays a significant role in society. You have to have the ability to get information from people here to people there. That's what media is meant to do. And in countries where I've mostly worked from, it's commercialized media, but even if it's state-owned media, it's still serving that purpose. It's still serving a purpose of getting information from important stakeholders to everyone else that needs that information. In a world where that's commercial, where that content has to be monetized, that system has worked quite nicely. Because you, even though we have, you know, pockets of us wanting, well, even though we have our confirmation bias of only wanting to read the FT and the Economist versus reading Apple Daily or something else, there was a variety of different publications that would suit everybody's needs. There was enough space to have balance and lots of different information in the rooms. There was enough space for lots of news in different areas, lots of trade press and specialist sectors. All of this sort of worked quite nicely. It was fragile, but it was sort of working. When the internet came and it went very large and big social media companies decided, Intellectual property? Yeah, don't think so. And just ignored all the rules. They completely undermined that system. Because now people who we're paying to go and research stuff, and when we're paying for that content, by the way, we're paying for content from a, from a newspaper, not just for the pleasure of that content, you're paying to get content that's written by someone that's qualified, that has to fact check that content, that has to get three sources for that content to make sure that it's true, and that can be sued if that content is inaccurate. That's what you're paying for. You're buying trust, right? If you make that trust unpurchasable, then the only content that's left is now no longer trustworthy, right, by definition. So we've created a technological system that's undermined quality content. So for the newspaper industry, you've just seen plummeting profits over the last 15 years, 20 years now. And that's meant that reporters get paid less and have to work five times harder. It's meant that the focus on clicks and commerciality is much, much higher because margins are narrower. 
You can't have, you know, it used to be in publications that they would have bits that were profit driven and bits that they kept because they knew it was important for their brand. They'd have a cooking section because it was important to have cooking and exercise and livestock. It didn't make any money, but you'd have it. That's gone. Anything that doesn't make money has been stripped out. Journalists have gone from voicing a story a day, you know, getting up in the morning, going out and talking to a few people, working out a story, thinking it, doing some interviews, fact checking it, and then publishing that story the next day. They've gone from that to doing five stories a day and having to turn a couple of them into videos and then having to do a couple of posts on them and getting smacked around if they're not getting enough likes on those posts. This is not a situation in which you're going to breed and create trustworthy content. And then we all start getting that content and we think, well, this is rubbish. I'm going to stop paying for it. Down the spiral. So what can you do to fix this? I'm an optimist. Doesn't show, does it? But I am an optimist. And I think what's going to happen is we're going to see the technology actually swing back the other way and help us monetize media again. So if you look, for instance, at uh, DLT, distributed ledger technology, the stuff that blockchain is built on, you now have the ability to make a payment rail that can rapidly do transactions of a fraction of a penny, which is impossible right now. If I want to pay for a newspaper article with my credit card, it just wouldn't work because the amount of money I've got to spend for the transaction fee counters out the ability for the newspaper to charge me one penny. You put it all onto a blockchain and you can charge tiny amounts. You could be able to theoretically to be able to charge for the number of words I've read. And our technology is getting there. You can see where my eyes are looking on lots of screens. So media companies will be able to say, well, he read the first paragraph in the headline and he spent three minutes on that. Therefore, I can charge this amount. And that could automatically be going on a payment rail to me and coming off an account. And there, boom, content is monetized again. It's only going to work, though, if wonderful companies like Facebook agree to play by the rules, which they're slowly beginning to do. Um, and I think, again, that pressure will change. So I think we are going to hopefully enjoy a generation of a rebound in media. I think we're going to see increased trust in journalism again, and I think we're going to see it re-monetizing in a better way, provided we can force some of the tech companies into some very important regulation that they need to need to adhere to. I mean, it's amazing to me that they are called social media. They have media in their title, and yet they refuse to be regulated as media. We've got to fix that, and then we'll get trust back in journalism. Okay, so there is hope and optimism for the journalists in the room. Okay, two questions. Maybe the first hand was here, and then there was a question back there. We have 10 more minutes left Thank here. you for sharing. My question. Yeah, and I want to talk, ask the question about social media. And I remember Donald Trump said, um, um, Twitter banned Donald Trump and Taliban using Twitter. And who, who can have authority to decide who can Afforded to using Twitter or social media yes. or yeah. desired freedom of speech. Yeah, thank this you. This is exactly the point. This is exactly the point. And traditional media has thrived of having dealt with these problems over the years and they've worked out how to do it. And we create ombudsmen and regulators and editorial boards. We had systems for exactly this so that we could decide what's worthy to print and what isn't. Social media refusing to be regulated, that now lives in the hands of Jack Dorsey to decide who he can kick off and not. And that's absolutely wrong. And because of Article 230 of the Communications Decency Act, they're also immune to being sued for that. That's staggering. If you as a journalist, any of the journalists out there, you know what the comeuppance can be if you get stuff wrong in a paper. You are not just going to lose your job, but the paper could get sued. There are serious consequences of doing bad journalism. Yet I can go and put something absolutely egregiously ridiculous on Twitter if I'm the president of the US, and get away with it. That's got to change, has to change. And, and I've also, one thing again, being optimistic, I think that the gradual decline in trust in social media reflects a growing recognition of people understanding that. And people understanding actually, yeah, okay, maybe newspapers are a good thing because we can sue them and they probably won't. Be yes, they might be biased, but at least they fact check. Um, so yeah, the question, to, to the answer to your question of who should be deciding, regulators. They should, be, they should be, whatever market they're operating in, they should be regulated as media and follow the same rules. And if that means setting up new regulators, then I think we should do that one as well. Good, thank you. Question back there. Hi, 
Hi, Adrian. Because uh, I think it's really nice to hear you take Cafe Pacific as an example, because I'm currently working at Cafe Pacific in marketing and communication field. So uh, obviously, the business of our company is greatly uh, impacted by COVID and also political issues. And I'm not sure if you heard about, we are currently rebranding ourselves as Cafe to include not only flights, but also lifestyle business, including like new Quranic credit cards, uh, dining, and also uh, uh, cafe shop. So do you think this kind of rebranding is a, a good way to re build the trust and also explore the business in different aspects? It's so it's just a, me it's a client, to, yeah. so my answer is going to have to be very carefully phrased here. <laughs> it's just me to curious on this I, question. Let, it's let, okay. Let, let me put it this way: um, I don't think it's been done. I don't think that move is done out of trust. I don't think that's the objective. I think um, it's an incredibly smart move to adapt to a new aviation industry, which will see a bit less travel for a while, and an understanding that therefore our experience of travel will be a richer one. We'll probably do it less, and it'll be more of a thing. And I think it'll be interesting. We'll probably be willing to pay a bit more for it. We used to hate the flight. The flight was the worst bit of going on holiday. It was the bit you wanted to be over so you could arrive there. We're probably now, we'll get a bit excited if we're on a plane now. And I'm thrilled if I get on a plane at the moment. Um, so I think the change in how we experience flight is going to be significant. And I think rebranding to a lifestyle business that caters to that whole experience around it and is a more present brand in our life outside of just the moment that we're on the plane is incredibly smart for driving flywheel revenue streams. I don't think it's designed to improve trust, and I don't think it will necessarily, but I think being present in people's minds in a positive way all drip feeds to restoring trust. Each little dot on the map that is a positive experience repaints the picture into something slightly different and helps us just forget and get over some of the stuff that we're worried about from before. So I think it will help tangentially, but I doubt it was designed just, I know it wasn't designed just for that. Um, I think it is a great move though. I'd, I'd be really interested to know what people in Hong Kong would think of it though. I know that the reaction to it was, hmm, but what, what do they mean, why? I think people were a bit confused about it. I think people thought partly it was just a way of selling a new credit card. So I think the reaction at the moment is a bit confused. But I think over time, it will work very well. Adrian, thank you. We have time for like one more question or so. There we go. So hi, uh, thanks for sharing. So, because um, as you mentioned, uh, the people trust uh, towards the uh, social media or the uh, traditional media are much lower than before, but we all know that uh, this are the mainstream or the important channel we uh, when we are formulating the marketing strategy. So like the last video, uh, videos you showed, so when we are trying to hold a marketing campaign, what is the key or essential components we should be aware of? So I, I want to ask this kind of practical questions when yeah, we are very really practical, yeah. very practical. Thank you. So, and so this this brings up a really important thing actually, which is trust is important, but it's not the be all and end all, right? Low levels of trust doesn't mean low levels of influence. I don't trust lots of rubbishy newspapers, but if I pick one up and read, if I pick up the National Enquirer and read that J-Lo is pregnant and having a baby with an alien from Mars, I'm not gonna believe it. I definitely don't trust it, but I'm absolutely gonna share it with a bunch of my friends because it's hilarious and bizarre. So low trust doesn't equal low influence, and there's a balance there as to what you're trying to achieve. If you're a really fun brand like Oatly, you might be fine with that. You might be fine with getting more reach by being irreverent and not necessarily aiming for trust, but aiming for eyeballs. If you are a bank or an insurer, absolutely not. It's going to be all about trust. So I think what you need to look at when you're doing marketing campaigns is your metric is what do I want people to think, feel, and do? 
And if you can understand what I want to think, feel, and do, you'll then just, do, and it's as simple as that, honestly, we overcomplicate it a lot because it helps us charge our clients more. Um, but it, it is as simple as thinking, what do we want people to think, feel, and do differently? And then it's a mapping exercise of what do I need to say to whom and through what channels to get them to think, feel, and do that. And it, it, I wish I could tell you that it's more rocket science than that, but it honestly does boil down to that on most occasions. The tricky bit is the science of really understanding that and measuring it. Think it through. I say what I want you to think, feel, and do is X, Y, and Z. I want you to feel positive about Cathay. Great. How do you measure your positivity to Cathay? How do you measure someone's feelings? It's incredibly hard when you think about it. Even if you ask someone how they're feeling, they're very poor at expressing it because feelings don't go into words very well and also we tend to lie. So even though it's as simple as saying what do we want people to think, feel and do, the art in it and the science in it comes from trying to work out, right, how the hell do we establish that? How do we measure it? And then how do we track the efficacy of the different channels as we're doing it? But it's all... This is the plus side of social media and the digital world. It's now all become very much more measurable. Right? We used to do it through advertising and PR, stick up billboards, make lots of noise at point of sale, do direct marketing, go into newspapers, and then we watch sales, and we hope the sales go up. It's a correlation. It's all you're seeing. You're not looking at cause or effect, and you're not really, you know, the, the old adage is, I know that 50% of my advertising budget is working, I just don't know which 50%, and that was the case. Nowadays, we know that 20% of our advertising budget isn't working, we just don't know which 20%. But it is way more measurable now. And so we do live in a world where you can gauge that reaction and track stuff much more effectively. So what's become probably the most important new skill set in our whole industry is understanding technology and understanding data. Because that's probably the best route for us really being able to get inside that. Great. Thank you very much, Adrian. I think we have actually reached the end of our today's session. Um, so this was really a great productive one. Let's thank Adrian. Thank you very, very much for coming. That's been fun. And uh, we have the final gesture will be a wonderful little gift. Absolutely. So thank you very much. That kind of concludes our very long and hopefully fun and productive day. We will all see you next week and have a very nice rest of the weekend.